Well, we are in the book of Joshua. We've been there for some time. And when we think of the book of Joshua, uh, we think about things like the Jordan River crossing. When we think Joshua, we think of the Jericho moments when because of God and his being with Israel, they can go and capture a city by simply walking around it. We we think about victorious um, life when we think about the book of Joshua, except I've got to tell you that it's not always that way in the book of Joshua. We do have We have Jericho moments, but we forget sometimes about a little city named Ai where the Israelites actually suffer defeat because they have abandoned God and not followed his commandments. Uh, It's interesting that right on the heels of this great battle of Jericho, we find this little podunk town, Ai, that's able to defeat, defeat Israel. And I've got to tell you, that's how life is sometimes. It seems sometimes when we have the greatest spiritual moments, following right after that comes great moments of spiritual defeat. Sounds like a... ABC commercial, the joy of victory, the agony of defeat, but it's true. We understand that in the Christian life, sometimes we go through times of spiritual refreshing, and sometimes those are followed by times of spiritual drought. We know that sometimes when we come down from the mountaintop of being with God, we have moments that they are really low valleys in our life, and this story might remind us of that. It's interesting, though, we do come across the only defeat of Israel recorded for us in the book of Joshua. It's also the only place in which we find Jews killed in the book of Joshua. And it's because, not that God has been unfaithful, but because man has been unfaithful. And we find a a man named Achan who doesn't follow through with the commandments of God. And that's where we find ourselves. Chapter 7, chapter 8 of the book of Joshua. Chapter 7 is about this great defeat, and it happens because of one man's sin. Chapter 8, they set the situation right, and they go on to be able to defeat the city of Ai, and we're going to look at both those chapters briefly this morning. I'm not going to be able to read all of it. I hope that maybe you go home and read both these chapters in their entirety, but I do want to start with the first five verses because it sets the picture. It tells us a little bit about what's going on. We actually get details about the story, which at the time they knew nothing about it. So notice chapter 7, verse 1, but the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. And let me just stop there. Remember God said in Jericho, go destroy everything and everyone. You're supposed to give it as a sacrifice to God. Well, we find here in the story, one man does not do that, and he keeps some of God's devoted things for himself. And so it says the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Camry, son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the people have to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it, and do not weary all the people, for only a few men are there. So about 3,000 men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. And at this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Now, it's an interesting story. Ai, it's a small podunk town. It's nothing compared to the fortified walls of Jericho. It's interesting the Bible tells us here that they sent spies up, and you need to understand that language because it's only 10 miles away, but interestingly enough, it's a climb of about 3,000 feet. They're heading west. They've crossed the Jordan River. They've taken the first city they've come to, Jericho. They're really going to try to sever the country in half by going clear all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, and the next place, it's this small town. It's this town named Ai. Not many men there, but it's an important spot nonetheless. We've probably forgot stories about how Abraham, many years ago, this is the first place he came to when he came into the promised land. In fact, it's there that he first calls on the name of the Lord, and in Genesis chapter 12, we actually get the great promise to Abraham. This is that spot. We also forget stories. We remember a story maybe of Jacob and Jacob's ladder, where he sees a ladder going up into heaven. Well, guess what? It's near Bethel, this very same spot, where Jacob himself is promised, look, you will one day inherit this land. It's at this spot. And so we realize it's a small little ho-dunk town. But understand, it's a place of God's promise, where God promised Abraham. And, and later, we understand Jacob's ladder here. And so it's an important battle for symbolic reasons. And yet, at this very symbolic place, 
36 Israelites are killed. And we understand as we remember this passage, it's because they've kept back, at least one man has kept back some of the devoted things, the first fruits that belong to God. I've got to tell you, actually in preparing for this battle at Ai, they made several mistakes. There were several missteps. Uh, First of all, it's it's interesting to find out We see they're overconfident. I mean, they've been able to take Jericho without lifting a finger by just marching around because God won the victory for them. And yet, in in this passage, we understand, ah, it's a small place. We don't have to worry about it. We'll just take a few men. They only take a few to do that. And so they're overconfident. But worse than that, we understand this is the first action in the book of Joshua where Joshua himself doesn't seem to, or at least doesn't appear to seek out God's instructions. Before he's saying, okay, okay, God, how do we do this? What do you want us to do? God, what is your plan for us? We see no hint of that. Joshua only acts on the information of the spies he sends forward. And so we've got some problems already, but we know ultimately the problem is not those things, although those are significant. The problem is that here we understand that Achan has not followed God's word. When they were destroying the city of Jericho, they were supposed to destroy everything and everyone. And Achan actually kept back some of the possessions, some of the loot for himself. It's interesting that uh, we really find out the problem is with man. Uh, man has broken covenant with God. Not that God has been unfaithful, but the Israelites, at least one of them, did not keep covenant with God. It's interesting that we also find Achan. He's on the right side of the conflict, I mean, he's fighting for Israel, but he's on the wrong side of God. He kept devoted things for himself. He kept what was supposed to be the first fruits, the first offerings to God. And it's interesting to see the language he uses because it's, for example, the very same language that Eve used when she saw the apple. She saw the apple. She coveted the apple. She ate the apple. It's the same language that later in James, in James chapter 1, we see this is a progression of what we do when we sin. We first look at something, and then we covet something. We want it for ourselves, and we take it as our own. That's actually the language of Achan. He saw stuff, he coveted it, and he kept it for himself. And we realize he kept back some of the best treasures for himself. If you look through the story, we find, first of all, he gets this fine Babylonian robe, and he keeps it for himself. You might uh, liken that to a, uh, a designer suit. A designer suit, I guess, like $1,000. I don't really know because mine all come from like J.C. Penney. But the price of a Babylonian suit, 1000 bucks. The price of 200 shekels of silver, that's five pounds, $40 an ounce, that's $3,200. The price of a wedge of gold. Now, this wedge is a pound and a quarter. We know that gold sells right now at least for fifteen seventy nine an ounce. We actually figure this is $31,000. It's a lot of stuff in a short, small package. And so we could tell you the price of Babylon your own, the price of shekels, the price of the sl- uh, sl- sliver of, uh, of gold, but the price of disobeying God. It's costly. I know, I'm supposed to say priceless. But he disobeys God for that stuff. And because of that, he is going to be killed. His family is going to be killed. Because of that, 36 men are lost in battle because they have not followed through with God's plan. Go destroy everything and every one. Now, here's the irony of the story. We know that at Jericho, they were supposed to go and destroy everything and every one. It's supposed to be the first fruits to God. Here are the instructions. Actually, when they're going to go and conquer Ai, except they've disobeyed, guess what they're told in Ai? If you go to chapter 8, verse 1, you can go destroy things, but take back anything you want. Here's the, uh, the, 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 the interesting irony of the story. When, when Achan's supposed to go and destroy everything, he keeps back for himself. If he would just waited one more battle, he would have gone and he could have taken back everything that he wanted for himself. But instead, he keeps the first fruits that belong to God. And because of that, Israel is going to experience defeat. Now, we look at this passage, and I've got to tell you, a lot of times we stop and say, how could God destroy or punish a whole nation because of one man? Or how could God destroy a whole family because of one man? And a lot of times we want to focus our attention on God and his response, and we fail to notice the actual problem in this story. The problem is, man did not keep covenant with God. Now, if you weren't here last week, you might want to stop and say, okay, how can God act the way he does? We talked about how can God act this way, and you might want to listen to that sermon. But I want to make just a few observations about this, this text and maybe how it applies to our life. And the first observation is simply this. It's, it's easy to blame God. God, what in the world did you do? God, why did you cause this to happen? And I want you to notice this is actually Joshua's first response when they experienced defeat at Ai. 
Notice chapter 7, verse 6, for example, and following. Joshua tore his clothes. He fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, now wait a notice, he questions God. Actually makes three questions of God. Sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan River. And so he blames God. Oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country, they'll hear about this, they'll surround us, they'll wipe us out, our name, from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? See, they experience defeat, and the first thing Joshua does, Joshua, he falls to the ground, and in, in the, 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 the response of mourning of that day, they, they tear their clothes, and they put dust on their head, and he's saying, oh, poor me. And then he looks up to heaven, and he cries out, God, why do you do this to us? God, don't you know what you're doing? It's interesting, really, to look at these questions. You notice these three questions, and we stop, and we just kind of look, look at the questions. I, I, notice, I want you to notice the, the, the language that he uses here God did you bring us across the Jordan just so we can be destroyed now it's interesting that's the same language that the children of Israel used after they crossed the Red Sea and they came into the desert of Egypt God you bring us out here to die notice what he does he's seen all the miracles of God and yet now he's blaming God God why do you bring us here so we'd be destroyed we'd be better off on the other side of the Jordan we'd be better off wandering in the wilderness he asks another question what can I say when people hear about this they're gonna wipe us out You see, he's pointing his finger at God and saying, God, you should know better. God, let me tell you what you did wrong. God, you should have never let this happen. And here's Joshua, even after the great battle of Jericho, he's pointing the finger at God and saying, God, I can't believe you did this. God, what are you going to do to restore your own great name? You've made a mess of things. You've ruined your reputation. God, how are you going to make this right? And Joshua's first response is to blame God. And I've got to tell you, that's kind of our first response too. When we go through hardship, when there's turmoil in our life, we want to point our finger at God and say, God, you don't know what you're doing. God, let me tell you how to do. God, you should have never let this happen to me. God, it's not fair. And we want to stop and we want to blame God. And the problem is we don't know the whole picture. See, we know something about this story that Joshua doesn't yet know. It's not that God has abandoned his promise. It's actually that someone among the camp of Israel, they've broken covenant with God. Achan has kept back stuff for himself. Joshua doesn't know it, but that's what happens. And see, the same thing's true in our lives. A lot of times we want to blame God, and yet we don't know what's going on. We're blaming God, and we're blaming the wrong, wrong person. You see, a lot of times it's the sin of other people that causes problem. And rather than than blaming God, we should say, man, some people have really blown it. Sometimes it's ourselves. We're blaming God, but it's really our fault. Sometimes we're blaming God, and it's actually Satan's fault. But I've got to tell you, we too are quick. We don't know the whole picture, but we're quick to blame God and say, God, you don't know what you're doing But again, God has not brought broken covenant. Israel did. Actually, God's response is quite interesting. As we read further, we get down to verse 10. After after Joshua's been bellyaching on the ground, God, God says this, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? And then he points out the the truth of the matter. Israel has sinned. They they violated my covenant, which I've commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things, the the first fruits. They've stolen. They've lied. They put them with their own possessions. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. Look, it's not my fault. It's actually somebody among your midst. It's somebody among Israel that has done this. And so he points out the problem. You're pointing your finger at God, and let me tell you, God says it's not my fault. I've got to tell you, there's great application here for us, and we would do well to remember. Maybe you should even write this down. When we want to blame God, we don't know the whole story. When we want to blame God, it's not God's fault. Let's look to our fellow man. Let's look in the mirror. Maybe let's put the the blame in the right place. It's not God who's broken covenant. It's man. Well, there's a second application that I I think we should make as we look at the story. And again, it's easy for us to say, okay, God, why are you doing this? Why would you punish all of Israel for one man's sin? Why would you punish all of Achan's family? But I've got to stop and point something out that we would do well to remember. And that's simply this. Sin is not an individual affair. Sin is actually communal. And I want you to notice the words here of verse 11 and 12. Israel has sinned. Now, it's Achan and his family, but Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant. I will not be with you anymore until you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction, those first fruits that were supposed to be given to God. 
Go and consecrate the people. You need to set this straight. Understand, sin, we think, is an individual uh, activity. If you interview people in our world today, we believe sin is an individual act, a single act committed by a single person, one person. You'll hear this type of language. It, it's my life and I'll do what I please. It's my personal choice. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Look, whatever I do in my own private, it's my, my thing. Sin's this personal choice. Problem is we believe that the consequences of sin are personal as well. People will give this justification. You've heard it. As long as it doesn't affect anybody else. Look, it's my body. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's not really hurting anyone else, but I've got to tell you, that's not biblical. Because sin is never personal. Sin is actually interpersonal. Uh, First of all, sin is a direct violation of the very character of God. He's the one that made you and created you, and so it severs that relationship. But you need to understand, sin is communal. Sin is interpersonal. Sin doesn't just affect the individual. There are all kinds of people that are affected by other people's actions. We live in a relationship. We live in a relationship with our husbands and our wives and our children and our community and people at work. And when you do things, those consequences, they ripple throughout the the whole community. And you know it's true. When somebody goes and steals, you think, okay, well, it's just one person they're hurting. No. Actually, all of us are hurt because people steal because all those expenses are passed on to others. Or what people do... They have consequences, and you know in your own life somebody has done something, or maybe even that somebody is you, and you've done something, and it's had long-lasting, far-reaching consequences because we don't live in in a bubble or a vacuum. Sin is interpersonal. We live in relationship, and consequences of sin ripple throughout society. Look around us, and we see those consequences It's not just an individual that's affected, often entire communities. One private act can damage whole communities and keep them from becoming what God wants them to be. We certainly know that one one mess up in church uh, by a leader, it can affect the whole church. But we also know it's true that somebody can go in and do devastating things because one private act, we need to understand it's it's not private. It's interpersonal. And understand here, God had made a covenant with people, all of his people, and that covenant was broken. And so God says, look, you need to get things right. There are people among you, there's an individual among you that's not following covenant. You need to take care of it. While the world minimizes sin, eh, that's not that big deal. Understand, sin scars and mars the image of God in us. Sin is a direct attack on God's nature, on God's character, Uh, Sin is one of those things that God can't do. We know that God can't lie. God can't sin. God can't even look at sin. And when we start realizing that sin is an intentional, deliberate violation of covenant, we understand sin is a serious thing. And we need to start remembering we can't take sin casually. And so I've got another application for you. Application is simply this. God takes sin seriously. And if God doesn't wink at sin, if God takes sin seriously, shouldn't we take sin seriously as well? Just an observation, but from our text. Well, there's a a third thing, and and so far I've got to tell you it's been... It's been pretty hard stuff. Sin, okay, there's con- there, there, sin's a hard thing. There's consequences for sin. I also understand that God doesn't take sin lightly, and sometimes we stop and blame God for what's really our fault. But I've got to tell you, as I look at the story, even a story where 36 men are killed, even a story where we're going to find out Achan and his family are killed, even a place where, where Israel has lost in battle, I've got to stop and, and say, you know what? I actually see redemption in this passage. In fact, that was God's plan all along. And I see, again, God's grace and mercy here. And here's the next thing I just want to point out, my observation about this text. I've got to say, there's room for repentance here. And I want you to specifically notice the language, even when it comes to Achan. I want you to notice the language here, this guy that's stolen, and because of that, all of Israel has been punished. Notice the language. God tells Joshua, go consecrate the people. Notice the next phrase. Go tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow, in the morning, present yourselves. And he gives these instructions. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home. I want you to consecrate yourself. I want you to tell all of Israel, go home tonight. I want you to consecrate yourself. And here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow, we're going to start with the nation, and we're going to divide it up into the, tw- tw- the tribes, and we're going to have the tribes come forward, and then we're going to have clans within the tribes come forward, and then we're going to have families within those clans of tribes 
come forward. And then we're going to have individuals from those families, from those clients, from those tribes to come forward. You understand the picture of what they're going to do. God's going to narrow it down and say, it's this guy. But when does that happen? It happens tomorrow. Tell all Israel, go home and consecrate yourself. And we know that Achan does not come clean until he's singled out. But I just want to ask you the question, I wonder why go home, consecrate yourself, and I wonder why tomorrow, here's what we're going to do. And I wonder why the whole process, God knows who it is. He can say, hey, I know who the guy is. It's this guy. He doesn't have to go through this whole ordeal of bringing tribes forward and clans forward and families forward. You understand what I'm talking about? And I'm just wondering, what would have happened if Achan, when Joshua first stands up the prior evening, he says, look, we need to go home and consecrate ourselves. There's sin in the camp of Israel, and God's going to punish us because of that. In fact, that's why we've lost the battle. I just wonder if that evening, what would have happened if Achan came clean and said, Joshua, it's me. I think there was still but have con- but been consequences for the sin. But I-, I just think maybe the consequences would have been less severe. And, and even the following morning, if he got up the very first thing, he's been thinking about it and praying about it all night, if he got up the next morning early before they start the whole rigmarole, and at that time he went to Joshua and said, Joshua, it's me. Or maybe, maybe even if they start singling out to 12 tribes and thinks, oh, you know what, I'm going to get caught. I'm going to come clean before I get caught. Or maybe during the times of the clans or the families, I'm just wondering what would have happened if he would have come clean earlier. Why all of the rigmarole? I'm going to suggest to you maybe it was because God was trying to be merciful and say, look, I'm giving you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. But Achan never does it. In fact, as it's interesting, as they go through the, the tribes and the clans and the families and the individuals, it's not until Achan himself is singled out and Joshua says these words. And I want you to notice the words in verse 19. Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to God the God of Israel. Give him praise. Tell me what you've done and don't hide it from me. And at that point, finally, Achan does part of the request of what Joshua asks. Joshua actually asks, give praise to God, my son. Give him glory and tell us what you've done. Achan only goes for the latter part of that and says, this is what I've done. I've stolen a a Babylonian robe. I've got some silver and some gold that I took. It's only after he's been caught, caught red-handed, that he comes clean, and because of all that, I've got to stop and say God gave him plenty of time. I think even now when he's saying, look, come clean before God and give him praise, I think even at this moment there may be some chance for repentance, but, but Achan doesn't do it. And maybe I need to make another application here. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference between disclosing a sin after being caught and true repentance, isn't there? See, he repents because he has been caught, not because he's sorrowful or remorseful. He doesn't come clean thinking, oh man, I did a terrible thing. It's not until he is standing in front of Joshua when Joshua says, look, we know what you've done. Come clean. That he finally admits, okay, I'm guilty. Here's what I've done. I've got to tell you, that's not true repentance. You know, it's interesting. We're given the same kind of language in the Bible. There is a day coming when Jesus comes back and every man will stand in front of Jesus. And at that moment, Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? But I've got to suggest to you a little bit too little, a little too late. You see, that's not the time to come clean. We can learn this lesson from Achan. Actually, you probably should come clean before that moment because at that moment, it's too late. True repentance is being sorrowful for our sins. Say, God, I've made a fool of myself. I've done things I shouldn't have done. God, I've got to come clean before you and forgive me, I have sinned. God, you're such a great God. I can't believe you're willing to accept us, but here I am asking and begging for your forgiveness. And I I just think of this passage, if Achan would have done that, maybe the consequences wouldn't have been so severe. And I'm suggesting to you that um, that's what we need to do. Uh, There's probably another application here that we need to understand. Not as only, only is sin a terrible thing, but sin has consequences. And ultimately, all of us will be held accountable for what we've done except if we're under the blood of Jesus. See, sin has consequences, and it's actually because of that very thing that Jesus came to to offer us a solution. Jesus came and became sin for us, and so that our sins could be forgiven. But in order for us to receive that forgiveness, we've got to come to him before it's too late and say, we have sinned, we need your help. God, have mercy on me. But understand, sin has terrible consequences. 
just a few observations about, about the text. You know, um, as, as, as we look at this, uh, to miss that last point, sin has consequences. It's actually a miss the very reason why Jesus came to die for us in the first place. Jesus came to pay the price for our consequences. You see, if there were no consequences for sin, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die. And those people are saying God's going to wink at sin. They don't realize how costly sin is. And we need to understand ser- sin is a serious thing because it costs Jesus his life. That's how serious it is. Sin has consequences, and you must come clean before it's too late. Well, Achan, he comes clean, but it's too little too late. I've sinned. You'll find the things I stole in my tent, buried there. And it's interesting that, that Achan is actually killed. But it's not just Achan that's killed. Actually, all of his family is killed along with all his possessions destroyed. And people again stop and they want to say, God, what are you doing here? Isn't that a bit severe? I just got to point out, actually, no. Sin is a terrible thing. It's got consequences. But understand what Achan did. Achan actually went home to his tent, right? He dug a hole in the floor and he buried the things there under his tent, right? That's the story. Think anybody else in his family knows about this? Hey, Dad, what's that hole in the floor? Do you understand? Actually, they were willing accomplices, likely. And so they had gone along with this, too, and they had also seen and, and coveted, and none of them came clean. And that God actually gives them, he gives them what they deserve. After Israel finds out and they take care of the matter, after they punish Achan for his sin. It's interesting that the the next chapter, chapter 8, they go back to battle. It's interesting how they go back to battle. And you need to read chapter 8. They actually go back and they they go much the same way it appears as they did the first time. They take a few men. They kind of march up the hill 3,000 feet to, to, to Ai. The people of Ai see him coming again and say, man, these guys don't learn, do they? It's kind of like that cat that keeps jumping back on your table, right? You throw it off, comes jumps back, back. These guys, they're coming back again. And so Ai thinks, hey, we'll go get them again. And so they come out of the town, and they start chasing these 3,000 guys back in the same direction they'd gone before, only this time God had given them other instructions. Look, take the rest of the people and actually kind of flank the city. And as soon as all the fighting men come out and chase you like they did before, you can cut them off after they've left the city. You can destroy the city, and you'll have them surrounded. And that's the battle plan that's the battle plan of chapter 8. And the end of that, they actually say, look, we've got to resolve not to, not to, to go against God anymore. And so that's the end of chapter 8. But it's interesting, I've got one more observation about chapter 7 and chapter 8 that sometimes we miss. And for me, this is the most valuable piece of information. You see, chapter 7 comes after chapter 5 and chapter 6, right? We get chapter 5 and chapter 6, and then we get chapter 7 and chapter 8. They kind of come in order. And I think that's on purpose, And the reason for that is chapter 5 and chapter 6, we had the battle of Jericho, right? And we know during the battle of Jericho, we've got a hero of the story. The hero of the story is actually a gal named Rahab. And then then we come to chapter 7 and 8, we see the defeat, and it's a guy named Achan, right? It's pretty obvious so far. But I've got to tell you, as you stop and look at this, God uses the most unlikely people to do his bidding. And I I want you to, to go back and think about one verse that talks about Rahab. Joshua spared Rahab. And then it's given a description of her, right? Rahab, the prostitute. And she lives among the Israelites this day. And then I want you to take you back. We we read this earlier, and I want want to take you back to the first verse of chapter 7, where we are now. And we read this story. Achan, son of Camre, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. And those names don't really mean anything to us, except this. They should if you were a, a person of Jewish descent. You see, these actually are are who's who among Jewish people. He comes from the right lineage. In fact, you can trace those down and say, okay, now I understand. These are important names. And notice where he comes from. He comes from the tribe of Judah. He's got all the proper lineage. He's got all the credentials. His parents and grandparents are the who's who among Israel. And I start seeing this comparison. You see, here we find Rahab, a prostitute, a Canaanite, a woman, And yet she's the one that God uses because she trusts God. She follows him. She sees God work and says, I want to be on that team. I'm going to follow God's instruction. I'm going to risk my own life. I'm going to stand up for the God of Israel, even though I'm not an Israelite. And because of that, God honors her. And by the way, we remember Rahab becomes part of the very lineage of Jesus Christ. She not only becomes a Jew, she marries a guy from Judah. 
and she is listed in both Matthew and Luke as part of the lineage of Christ, a very unlikely character. And yet I've got to tell you, Achan, Achan of the tribe of Judah, he's got all the credentials, all the background. He's from the right place, the right time. He has the right pedigree. We see a road and a signpost on that road that points in two different directions. Rahab pointing, pointing in the right direction, even though she comes from the wrong background. And Achan pointing in the wrong direction, even though he comes from the right pedigree. And I've got to tell you, there's another application here we need to hear. It's not your heritage. It's not your past track record that really matters. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. See, what matters is choosing to faithfully follow God's commands and to faithfully follow him no matter what. That's what really matters. And here we get two people going in opposite directions. One guy from the right place, the right time, with the right pedigree, making the wrong decisions. And one woman from the wrong place, the, right, the wrong side of the tracks, doing the wrong thing, who makes the right decision. And we find out God honors the one who comes clean before him, the one who follows his instructions, rather than the one that had the right heritage. You see two signposts pointing in different directions. Rahab without pedigree. Achan, all the pedigree in the world. And it's interesting that that story follows the story that we just, just looked at. We've got Jericho, and then we've got Ai. And I think here we get maybe our best application. And it's simply this. Which one of those paths best describe you? Maybe you're walking in the footprints of Achan. You're you're winking at sin and ignoring. Ah, it's not that big a deal, is it? I'm just going to keep some of that for myself. Maybe you're keeping back God's first fruits. You're ignoring God's repeated calls to repentance. Look, God loves you. He's offering you a chance. Repent now. Don't put it off till it's too late. Come clean. Follow God's instructions. Or are you really walking like Rahab, clinging to the grace of God, realizing it's only by his favor that we are allowed access we understand that we've got to partner with him rather than do things our own way. And I just wonder, which one of those best describe you? Will you, will you pray with me? Father, I want to come before you, and, and right now we realize it's not because of who we are, what we've done. It's not because of our lineage or heritage. It's not because of our pedigree that we're welcomed. Uh, we really realize the consequences of sin, that we're all sinners, and we've got to come clean before a, a holy God. But we realize also that for those people who come clean, you've offered us the blood of Jesus Christ for forgiveness that you offer, and your offer is a continual one of grace. And so, Father, help us, help us come clean and help us rely on the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's our prayer. And we pray this in the blessed name, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.